My name is Eduardo Rafael Munoz Munoz, and I'm a, a, an assistant professor at San Jose State University in California. And I am the, uh, the coordinator of a critical bilingual authorization program preparing teachers. And this program is called Bilinguismo y Justicia. Um, I define myself as a critical social linguist, thinking that in the critical, the applied goes also in there as well. If you ask me 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 15 years ago, I couldn't tell you that this was going to turn out this way. I mean, like, uh, this is not a master plan that, but certainly one thing led to, to another. I was, um, my first uh, degree is uh, in English philology and I, and I, where I studied in Spain. Um, and I became a high school uh, English teacher in, um, in Spain before coming here. And then I took the adventure and I also took the plunge to teach elementary, which was also not expected. It was a surprise. And when I landed here, I mean, literally I was all for adventure. And when I interviewed, um, I interviewed for Oakland Unified and reality is that I couldn't, back then I couldn't even place Oakland in the map. So I applied okay. and I only realized that it was what it was after I had been hired. So the brochure had a map in the back. I turned it around. I said, oh, wow, it's next to San Francisco. But then when I started uh, teaching in Oakland, the reality was, uh, I was in, it was in 2005. So um, they were, were fighting for survival in bilingual programs. And I was just brought here on a visa, on a very um, kind of weak position to exercise uh, leverage. I tried to maximize what I could do in in, uh, in troubled waters because that's what where we were. I mean, with reconstitutions and people coming and going, and uh, and I started getting into positions of uh, leadership at the school level, like with the school site council, and and starting to learn some of these things. Still, so, I was so green, and then then I, I had the, the the background in linguistics, and uh, and then I started working as a coach. And from there, I decided that I wanted to to implement or to kind of lead some change. And in so many ways, I was so so naive back then, rushing, rushing, running, running. And I became a principal. I got the, I went to UC Berkeley and I got a master's in in education there with a leadership component of becoming a, a principal in urban schools. And from there, back to principal in Oakland, and that was around 2010. And it was quite a ride. Uh, but again, many, many, many running, running rushing many many things had to be learned um, on one's feet and reacting quickly and it was it was not easy but then I realized that of course um, it was not that possibility of change and making change and having you're constrained by so many ways so I looked um, for other ways where I could have the impact that I think that my talents a few talents that I could have could be put to best service and then I decided to start my doctoral studies I was always a little bit of a nerd I, I can't deny that so I mean I said yeah let's go study some more um, and then I, I got my uh, doctorate from Stanford and where I have the opportunity of working with uh, Kenji Hakuda and, um, and uh, Guadalupe Valdez and recently as well with, uh, with uh, Jonathan Rosa. And that kind of, when you think of these three individuals, then you start start thinking about the angles that one's lenses are taking. It's a co-construction of lenses. Mentors influence you, but at the same time, you may have some preconditions and the context of what's going on. And, and uh, together with my teacher preparation background, linguistics, all that concocted into what I'm doing right now preparing teachers, bilingual teachers, and analyzing the context where they, where they work. I'm interested in issues of power and interested in, in issues uh, related to how society is perceiving and constructing the phenomenon of language. My dissertation, which is uh, entitled Destandardizing the Standards, and play, it plays with the, with the word standard as in standard language and standards as what uh, teachers are, are supposed to be teaching uh, or what their teaching is supposed to based on um, it takes a, a very specific um, uh, problem of, uh, of practice which is like teachers have to fulfill complete their portfolio uh, and in their portfolio they are supposed to be addressing a standards in California for teacher preparation which is which are called the teaching performance expectations which uh, are asking them to teach voila standard English and academic English and here of course we have a problem 
Uh, so in the dissertation, what I do first is um, I trace uh, the genealogy of the uh, of the TPEs as a policy document. So it has one leg, one chapter is devoted to analyzing the the political origin of uh, of this document and the documents that preceded it. And I do analyze from a post structural point of view um, uh, the creation of these categories. Um, then I move on to, uh, to do some work that was kind of uh, action oriented in the sense that I, I, I had a, a number of cohorts of uh, student teachers uh, in, um, in San Jose and uh, I was exploring what their understanding was of academic language and standard language and the uses in which they um, and the, the context in which they would use those and kind of exploring the kind of the ontology of those terms in their own eyes. Uh, from there, I moved into more specific uh, focus groups, uh, working uh, with candidates, exploring more in depth uh, what they understood uh, about those concepts and how that applied to the to the um, completion of that uh, portfolio. That was actually, among other things, requiring them: Can you please tell us the number of standard English learners that you have there, similar to English language learners? So that clearly poses a problem because you have to quantify and that clearly presents a, 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 an epistemological problem for them. And last, um, what I did kind of as a corollary to this uh, kind of extension is what I thought about what I entitled as a, as a beyond section of the of the dissertation, I um, uh, interviewed uh, sim uh, instructors in California and public and private universities uh, in a position similar to mine. Um, to to see what was their understanding of uh, academic and uh, and standard uh, language and the TPEs in general, and this was done with this idea of the ideological and implementational spaces uh, for in, in ecological uh, language planning and policy. So this idea is like how are they actually taking advantage of interstitial spaces to um, to actually use standard uh, the notion of standard deconstructed or academic and deconstructed and use it in their in in their instruction. So it was looking at these labels uh, from multiple angles. When when the the candidates, the student teachers, were actually defining all these terms, the definitions were uh, were it was a crossfire of definitions, and they were like it was shooting in all directions, which not only showed that there was a concept uh, instability, so to speak, as we may have already um, anticipated, but also that what I actually think is the real asset, which is that many of them were showing like anti counter hedge counter the hegemonic uh, uh, ideological stances which which was already there um, I mean again particularly uh, and also taking as a point of departure that this problem is created by the TPEs I mean it's pre-exists the TPEs itself but the TPEs just reiterate this problem because unlike many other standards you know normally standards and uh, policy documents that are intended to be low level in the policy change and more geared towards implementation they are going to have a glossary right so quite interestingly this document despite having received by reviewers uh, recommendations, please include the glossary, uh, doesn't have a glossary. So that puts it in an intertextual relationship with other policy documents and it's not, uh, it's uh, already depending on what other documents have said that the standard English learner is, depending on what are the documents about what academic language is, and that puts it in conversation with the California language policy, but at the same time, uh, it creates ambiguity for the primary user, in this case, uh, the teachers, the student teachers, because, mm, I mean, we guide them through critical policy analysis, but normally they are not going to go jump from from policy to policy to find the definition of, of standard English learner. Give me a number of how many standard English learners do you have in your student placement. I mean, what kind of research you need to do to figure that out? It's not only student teachers, field supervisors, um, university professors, as I show in the last uh, in the last chapter. Everybody thinks differently about that. You know, with the exception of LA, where they have a policy about the standard English learners and there's some definition. In the in in, uh, in the ELA ELD framework in California, uh, in reality, is it's not a very explored area. Particularly uh, problematic in the sense that while there's an entire industry around ELLs 
testing, etc., technologies that are uh, creating ELLs as a category, there's no such set of technologies generating, identifying, labeling. And again, we go back to uh, the trouble of uh, curricularizing language and labeling uh, uh, in students, which is something that uh, uh, my dear mentor Guadalupe Valdez has been exploring for so many years and even more so recently, right? I'm, I'm personally partial to the notion of emergent bilinguals because it's also inclusive of the varieties of language, uh, the, the, very, the very internal variation of, uh, of speakers, uh, as well as the bits and pieces that you get from other languages, given our, our whole uh, mixture of uh, hybridity that we have in, in our country, that puts you in, so to speak, in the spectrum of many multilingualism. So I like more that the flexibility and, and fluidity of, um, of emerging bilinguals, not only because of the, of the uh, asset-oriented aspect, but it's because it's, um, it's uh, emerging, I mean, uh, uh, emergent. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's a verbal form that indicates an ongoing process. The labels that we use are analytical categories that help us, but it's on with one hand we need to use them, but with the other we need to fight them. So it's a it's a little bit of um, it's it's an inner tension dynamic that needs to be um, always kept in mind when we are thinking about doing anti-oppressive work. We, again, problematizing the notion of target language and and this idea that they presume the linearity of processes and is supposed to be happening in a certain organized way. Tremendous work has been done with regards to uh, uh, analyzing the circumstances, the socio-political, socio-economic circumstances in which that second language learning, and again, we may even think about transcending this idea of second because it gives it a certain ordinal aspect and we may think about like uh, uh, language, linguistic repertoire amplification, <laughs> if we could rename our own sake, right? Any, any process of learning is, uh, is always located uh, in a historical um, moment in a particularly structured uh, condition and subject to certain conditions and constraints. And exposing those things as part of the learning and not a separate element of uh, learning is, is very important. Uh, analyzing how um, similar as, uh, as uh, what we have seen in the curricularization model that I mentioned earlier that uh, Guadalupe Valdez was working on, one of the components is the theories of language learning that often inform the policy movements and the reification of the consecration of certain linguistic uh, ideas about what is the right learning as opposed to the not so right learning. So we need to constantly scrutinize those because they assume um, uh, certain prototypical models of learning learning and this, this the insidiousness and the and the pervasiveness of ideologies because they are certainly very very subtle in how they kind of uh, trickle into our ways of thinking and and um, so we always have to be on guard and, uh, with regards to that and we have to call certain things out and we 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 should seek a, a way to influence uh, common policies that govern us as a society with things that we think that are that are right um, when we are, I think, thinking, thinking along the lines of, of uh, Lippy Green is this idea, whenever we are talking about language, it's, it's, it's never just about language, it's always about so much more. So um, when, uh, when we are uh, deconstructing labels, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, one of my early readings uh, the, that deeply influenced me in my way of, uh, because I was coming from an um, from, uh, educator, highly institutionalized kind of thinking. I had been, uh, I, I came as a visiting teacher from Spain because of the shortage of bilingual teachers. Then I was taught in elementary, then became a coach and then a principal. So these ideas, these very, very fine notions of academic language and results and targets. I mean, very no child left behind ish kind of situation because that's what the context where I was repurposed professionally or re reframed as a professional when I came to this country. So I have to kind of take a few steps back. And I remember um, uh, this, uh, the, the article of, uh, very early in my doctoral studies about um, by uh, Melinda Martin Beltran about uh, constructing the co-construction of uh, ELL categories. And that was kind of my first forays into uh, post-structural kind of thinking. And it was like, wow, I 
I mean, perhaps uh, we should rethink a thing or two about what we do here and about what's happening at the bottom level, at the day-to-day -day practices, those micro practices that are making those um, categories that can be harmful come alive. So, um, but at the same time, uncover, I mean, you deconstruct, but also construct the opportunities in which you can undo and, and construct uh, other kind of realities and ways of viewing reality that are much more positive and, and forward looking for, for individuals and particularly for minor, linguistically minoritized uh, populations. So when, when that reading came into my hands, uh, that was like a moment of illumination. That's something that we can do as educators. I mean, I have that reading when I teach Foundations for Teaching Second Language Learners. I have that article um, in my in my um, in my syllabus, and there could be some others like that. Like that, that particularly touched me. Uh, but I think that we need to prepare the teachers to then continue this dismantling work. So I mean, that's uh, that's part of the commitment that I see for myself and that I see um, future about. So we are we are never without the context, and we can also influence the context by by the teaching that we do. I mean, for the particular regard of, um, of bilingual teachers, uh, I'll just say for my, one of the things that I really like about the context where I am is that about 90% of the teachers, the, the bilingual teachers that I work with are what we have called uh, heritage bilingual teachers. So they themselves are coming from uh, often, uh, and they are critical and vocal about uh, coming from a linguistically minoritized uh, context, having suffered a famous Proposition 227, and having gone through uh, the pre language deprivation at the at the public institutional level, uh, raising uh, that awareness and contributing again. But with this idea of raising awareness, I'm always like mindful because it is not like. Mm, I, I, this very dialogic, the way that I that I like to approach it and the, and decentering the instructor. I mean, but first of all, if like we want them to decenter themselves, we will need to decenter ourselves first. We think the limitations and confines of uh, of teacher preparation programs that are subject to to many pressures in terms of length, in terms of structure, curricular content, is looking for those. Um, um, strategic moments uh, where you can get a lot of bang for your back and in developing that critical component. Uh, I One of the things that this past summer, for example, we've been redesigning our uh, bilingual syllabi for, um, for the foundation's courses and we have been more mindful in introducing uh, critical policy analysis components into it. So we want to develop then to develop the agency and uh, and to um, and to consider what happens with the micro policies at the at the school level, right? I mean, often with bilingual teacher education, it gets almost like symbolized and reified into what happens with the language separation policy, right? That has become like a, like a big. Uh, like a big reference in terms of uh, battling for micro policies. Micro, but that also have a macro relationship because that is the local reenactment of a specific beliefs. It has been curricularized. Um, so prepare them to, to subsist as well and to be culturally sustaining and to actually navigate the policy, those policies that are often uh, enforced by people that are very... Um, uh, they have lots of great assets. Uh, they are also really invested in maintaining certain status quo, even when they might not perceive it like that, or they simply perceive that they are just done with the fads. Oh, we have already had too many fads coming from academia, too many fancy names. I mean, we are going to do what we think is right. I mean, Recently, I was um, writing a piece, a piece about translanguaging along these lines, and and that was what, what um, I was able to capture from from one principle. What we have heard from many principles, uh, like no, we need to do it like this, because the other thing, until we have real proof, we don't know if that's just an experiment. And then, of course, that's a question for us um, in the field. What is real proof? Uh, I mean, for me. I see the channel into influence right through the preparation of teachers, right? But at the same time, there are activist groups that are also benefit from getting a connection with, uh, with academics because that kind of galvanizes their, some of the areas of their activism. And, and that's something that um, we, can, we can certainly contribute to. We are still working towards that resurgence of bilingual education, but I think the seeds are there. Um, after Proposition 58 and the number of bilingual teachers uh, needs to grow. And uh, so I decided that that was, I, I think that's where there is a, 
a cause that's not too easy, but at the same time, uh, it is not uh, impossible. I think it's in a perfect ZPD for me professionally to push that bilingual program from uh, low numbers into big numbers and by that changing bilingual education in our area. With regards to the societal struggles that we are um, undergoing currently that they are reaching a certain climax right now. I mean, we also have to acknowledge that it is now, but it is not just now. It is only, in a way, media has focused on things and it has crystallized a certain necessary moment. Uh, unfortunately, often in previous uh, so, uh, social movements, we've seen a little bit of uh, decline. Uh, for example, I remember Occupy, which to me personally was very inspiring. What we need to make sure is that we, we are armed with good fuel and with also good empirical and uh, ideological and intellectual fuel so that this movement is not fading like uh, others unfortunately have in the past because, I mean, we really need to push hard and that's what people are talking about. Like, we need to really to push hard to go over the hill and make that change happen. And in that respect, I think that um, we researchers, scholars, uh, um, we, have a, we have an ethical commitment and a duty to, to serve in going that over the hill and then the next hill and the next and the next. So yeah, I'll leave it there.